Welcome to the Shikama Live Show with your host, Shikama. From Ars Technica by Jonathan M. Gittin. Meet the VBB-3, the world's fastest electric car. This electric record machine is built by students at the Ohio State University. The Venturi Buckeye Bullet 3 combines two things we love here at Ars Technica, land speed records, and electric vehicles. You can add the Shikama Live Show in that list of people that like those two things. It's a collaboration between Venturi and Monegasque Electric Car Company and the Ohio State University that aims to break 400 miles per hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats while simultaneously acting as a test bed for future electric vehicles and the young engineers who work on it. Fortunately, Columbus, Ohio is less than a day's drive from Washington, D.C., so Ars Technica took a look. VBB3, its nickname, is the third land speed car to come from the Center for Automated Research car in Columbus. Its long, thin shape has been dictated by aerodynamics unencumbered by the draggy intakes required for to feed air-breathing engines. It has a pair of electric motors, each good for 1,500 horsepower, and powered by eight large lithium-ion battery packs. Earlier VBBs set records in 2009 and 2010 but last summer, terrible south conditions prevented VBB3 from running a proper test program to 400 miles per hour and beyond. Each axle is powered by its own electric motor. The starting point is the same EV motor Venturi built for its sports car, running here at a much higher voltage. In fact, there are actually two EV motors in each unit. Quote, it's two motors sharing a cooling system and a common shaft, team leader and former graduate student David Cook said, told us. It makes more manufacturing sense to build smaller motors and couple them together than trying to build one big motor. Today, that motor is putting out about 1,000 horsepower in the dyno, but it's capable of 1,500. The team is continuing to develop the powertrain particularly the inverted control, to give VBB3 the 3,000 horsepower it needs. Quote, Motor technology is already there, Cook said. The real limit is where you get the energy from. For VBB3, that means lithium-ion battery packs from A123, VBB2 used hydrogen fuel cells. The team engineered students at OSU, remember, did the rest, integrating them in the powertrain, cooling them, and so on. There's a total of eight battery packs on the car, four on either side of the carbon fiber cockpit tub, enjoying a new life after retiring from its previous career as a Dalari IR03 IndyCar. Two battery packs are bussed together and fed into each inverter the hardware for which is supplied by American Traction Systems. The inverters just look like large metal boxes ahead or behind the wheels, but they convert DC from the batteries into the AC needed for the motors. Keeping the motors cool enough during the car's minute-long runs is crucial. Quote, The real limit is how hard you can push the motors is ensuring you don't exceed the temperature limits of the magnets and electrical windings and insulations, Cook said. These motors have oil cooling jackets over the stator, and we also pump oil over the magnets for the best possible cooling. Radiators would mean vents or intakes, which would in turn mean drag. Therefore, VBB3 has closed loop cooling system instead. Quote, we have a water tank we pack full of ice and pre-chill as much as humanly possible before the race, Cook explained. 
that's all in one big Illumina housing up front. This year we also developed an off-board cooling loop for the motors so we have an ATF automatic transmission fluid oil chilling circuit that circulates around the motors. We get the motors and inverters down to about zero degrees Celsius before the start of the run and they're at operating temperature in around 60 seconds. The gearbox, a two-speed, is custom made by Hewland in the UK. Quote, the amount of torque the motors put out and how quickly they can do it requires some special th things from the transmission. By that point, with a really custom solution, we were able to do all of the other things we wanted, Cook said. One of those was hanging the suspension from the gearbox casing, something you usually see in prototype or open wheel race cars. Quote, another neat system we've developed is a full brake. We're the only land speed cars with a friction brake that will work at over 300 miles per hour. At the back of each gearbox is an auxiliary shaft connected to the brakes. At Bonneville, quote, at Bonneville, if you do have an incident, it's almost always linked to tires or parachutes. So we tried to look for all the measures we could take in both those directions, Cook told ARS. The carbon carbon brake discs come from the Embraer 145. It turns out with the brakes needed to stop a regional jet on a rejected takeoff are just about exactly what's needed to slow VVV3 from 400 miles per hour in two miles. Goodrich donated the discs after the team presented them with a well-engineered system. Cook said Goodrich was excited to be involved in this kind of industry partnership, supplying the parts and letting experimenters do interesting work. Having functional brakes has also been a boon for lower speed testing, we're told. Given the link between power, weight, and top speed, we were a little surprised to see so much steel rather than composites or more exotic alloys. But while Cook admits it's not always practical not to use steel, quote, it's still one of the strongest alloys we have. Even so, the initial design for VBB3 was going to feature a carbon fiber monocoque. The car was to be designed around a fast change battery system where a forklift could change the cells within two minutes. But the US and international land speed record rules required two runs to be completed within an hour of each other. But using carbon fiber instead of steel had a few challenges. Quote, the modeling method to understand beam strength of a 40-foot structure are a lot more proven for steel tube frames than they are composites. That's not to say you couldn't do it. We have the software, we got the results, but we've had added a much bigger factor of safety. That's what steel, Cook said. It's difficult to gauge at this scale of program with this number of students working on it. This isn't Boeing design plane wings. So what we ended up with was a really robust structure that's extremely stiff, but equally heavy, between 30 pounds lighter and 300 pounds heavier than the steel tube frame before you can have confidence in it. Taking on this type of engineering is no small feat. Manufacturing 40 foot long pieces of structural carbon means even bigger equipment adding between $500,000 and $1 million to the budget. And then there's a product problem of modifications. Quote, this is a very, very prototype vehicle, Cook said. A great example from this year is the gearbox. We really needed to be able to slow down the motors faster to reduce the speed to implement the shift. Decreasing the shift speed down to half a second means adding three components to the car, pointing at a part of the suspension frame. Cook explained that, quote, we're even looking at the slicing this tube or modifying this part of the chassis. With carbon, you now have this beautiful million dollar monocoque that's useless because there's no way to modify it. 
The tolerances required for the suspension and powertrain were also proving to be tricky. Quote, very few outfits in the U.S. were willing to even consider manufacturing for us. So that goes, got us away from wanting to build it out of composites, he said. Ultimately, the team put about 18 months into it and worked through three different models. With carbon fiber relegated to the bodywork, the focus was back on the metal tube frame. Cook said the design team didn't want to just settle for conventional off-the-shelf 4130 steel. However, none of the more exotic alternatives proved superior. Quote, the maximum rate sa weight saving was about 50 pounds, but cost goes through the roof. Weldability goes down, and in most of those metal vibration fatigues is terrible, he said. Using aluminum would mean inspecting the frame every second run to check for fatigue. Magnesium would have been very light, but with an incredibly complex welding process. Quote, we're in the middle of the desert, and there, if there are things that need to fix, it's hard to beat steel tubing. VBB3's design has to take into account a much harsher environment than all the other race cars and bikes built by the students at CAR. Corrosion isn't a problem at the salt flats themselves, but it surely is after spending a couple of weeks there. Quote, one year, we hadn't had time to paint the chases before Bonneville, so we knew we'd have to strip it when we got back. It was covered in salt and water, so we power washed it in Utah, and it was beautiful new metal. We got as far as Iowa on I-80, and everything just turned orange. It was like an explosion, Cook told us. Titanium and aluminum are used where appropriate, and Cook and his team have been exploring advanced coatings for other parts. They work closely with coatings groups in Dayton that does aerospace work, for example, and when visiting, we saw a brake system uh, being machined that was destined to be sent away for an advanced nickel coating. Quote, in most cases, these are things out there for a given application. You just get down to practicalities if we can. We should, we do that, Cook says. Over the winter, every nut and bolt comes off the car. Everything is prototype system, so we really have to watch everything we can. We'll inspect the entire chases. We do some non-destructive testing on the wells looking for cracks. We'll put all the battery packs apart, Cook told us. This year at the racetrack, we saw the most vibration that I think any land speed car has ever seen. Indeed, VBB3 was the only car to be timed on the Bonneville Salt Flat at in 2015, a consequence of storms that wrecked the surface of sp for speed runs. Quote, by the time we were racing, it was dry, but there were soft pockets just underneath the salt. The surface was blowing up like little landmines. In 2015, VBB3 pi pilot Roger Schroer was at least officially timed at 288 miles per hour. On his final run, he continued acceleration uh, to almost 300 miles per hour. VBB3 ended the day bleeding its crimson coolant onto the salt, the extremely bumpy track resulting in a punctured coolant tank. Quote, in general, vibration isn't an issue. If you're going to do 400 miles per hour, you expect a smooth, polished course, Cook said. We felt 300 was the limit this year. Schroer told the team the ride felt like what it must have been like to take off in a rocket. The vibration was so severe he couldn't focus on the market flag that lined the course. Even if it didn't reach 400 miles per hour, Cook told us that the team still learned a lot last year. Quote, every 25 miles per hour is a new boundary. We increase speed in 25 to 50 miles per hour in increments so you can look at the data. Is the car lifting? Are the tires right? Is the aerodynamics right? In that light, knocking the door of 300 miles per hour was a big milestone, even if the results is not quite as fast as VVB 2.5. Quote, yes, 
We've been there with previous cars, but this is an all new car, all new system, Cook said. I wish we had a bit more time this year with a better track. We all hope that 2016 grants Cook and the rest of EBB3 that wish, if so, don't be surprised if there's another 25 to 50 mile per hour increment or two to study. Thank you for watching the Shigama Live Show.